Hello, in this screencast I will walk you through the installation of Event Sentry version 4.0.3. I've prepared the screencast here by uh, downloading the installer for Event Sentry along with the web reports installer and a license file. It's not necessary to download the web reports installer separately since the main installer here will download the web reports installer automatically in the background. But if you're on a machine that doesn't have uh, internet connectivity, such as a secured network, then you'll want to download both installers and put them in the same directory. Also make sure that they're the same version. If you have a license file for Event Sentry, uh, you can put that into the same directory as the installer. And if you name it Event Sentry underscore license dot txt, then the installer will automatically attempt uh, to utilize that license file. If you're evaluating Event Sentry, uh, then you generally speaking only need the main installer uh, and you do not need the web reports or a license file. It handles everything else in the background, provided you have an internet connection. But let's get started with the installer here. We're going to accept the license agreement, pick a installation folder. We're going to keep the help checked, of course. The built-in database is optional. You can also point Event Sentry to a, another database that's on a different machine or a, another database that's on the same machine, for example, Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, but if you don't have another database or if you just want to you know, evaluate using the built-in database, then leave that checkbox there checked. And then, of course, the web reports, which you'll want to install um, in most cases as well. That's a component that gives you access to the data that Event Sentry collects, including dashboards, charts, uh, log search, and so forth. You can install the web reports on a different machine as well. And uh, we do have installers available for Linux and uh, Mac OS. 10. If you do install the built-in database as we are doing here, you need to pick a folder for the database itself, for database files. Make sure you pick a folder on a drive that has sufficient disk space. It can be a little difficult to free up disk space if there is no space left on the drive. Um, so make sure you pick a drive that has sufficient disk space. We're also going to open a firewall here to allow remote hosts to connect. Uh, if you're using the collector later on, you can set this to no and prevent other hosts from connecting to the database. So this is your call and of course you can always change those firewall rules later. Now we will pick a database administrative database password for the Postgres user. Make sure this is a secure password and write that down somewhere. I mean, not necessarily write, but note it down somewhere in your password manager. Here's the port uh, for the web reports. By default, we're using port 8080. You can change that to anything that's available on the system. And in this case, we'll definitely want to allow web traffic uh, to that port so that uh, you can access the web reports from uh, any machine on your network. And that's it. So that's all you need to provide uh, for the first part of the event entry installation. I'm going to speed up this video here now so you don't have to wait for the installation to complete. Normally this process takes about um, three to four minutes on a halfway decent machine, so stay tuned here. Okay, so the first part of the installation is now complete. Um, so the event center installation is actually divided into two parts. So the first part here copies the files, installs the database. And once you hit finish, uh, the second part of the installation commences, uh, which essentially gets prepares event center for first use um, by customizing the email settings uh, and letting you select which components you want to activate. So the first decision you'll have to make is whether you want to receive email alerts or not. Uh, if you don't want to receive email alerts, you can simply uncheck that box. Otherwise, you can choose between low, medium, and high. Low means uh, that you won't be getting any email alerts by default, with the exception of some drastic uh, issues with uh, some of the events and components. Uh, you'll still have the email action available and you can assign filter rules to it, but uh, no filter rules will be enabled by default. Medium will allow you to choose which type 
of emails you want to uh, receive. And I'll show you that on the next screen. And high means you'll want to receive as many emails as possible. So this means any sort of uh, warning or error that uh, is generated on your systems that's not excluded by some of our default exclusion rules. So we do try to prevent as much noise as possible. Uh, but there's so much software out in the market today that it's impossible to account for all possible false alerts that exist. So this, uh, so the high setting will require you, you know, to make quite a few customizations and ex set up exclusion rules so uh, to avoid those you know false alerts. Uh, so Medium is usually a good choice here because it does let you select um, what types of emails you want to receive. Event Sentry alerts means any sort of system health issue that Event Sentry detects. We're talking about things like disk space, performance alerts, inventory changes, um, and so forth. Uh, you'll get those by email. Generic system alerts are pretty much any other warning or error that occurs in the event logs. It could be something from uh, Microsoft server software like Exchange Server IIS, could be issues uh, with Windows itself, bad sectors and so forth. And then of course, finally, you have audit failures. Uh, we do, obviously, especially in larger networks, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, audit failures occurring on a regular basis. I Many as simple as somebody just typing in the wrong password. And we do have some um, rules in place that try to avoid some of the known noise from the security event log. Uh, but if you enable that feature, just know that you'll probably have to do some additional uh, configuration to exclude some of that noise. So I'm going to select the first two here and move forward. Here we have the mail server. I'm going to put that in There's a test button to verify that you can actually reach port 25 on that mail server. Sender name, so dollar host name, uh, is going to resolve to the actual host name of the machine at the time the email is sent. And then the email address you want to send this to. And now we have the database users. Event Sentry uses two different user accounts to connect to the database. One is used to write to the database. Um, so that's pretty much used by all the components like the agents, uh, collector, and so forth to write to the database. And then there's another user account that's being used by the web reports to read from the database. Um, so the different accounts need to have different passwords for security reasons. And the easiest way to move forward here is just to click the Generate button, which uh, generates a secure password. And you can click the Save As button here uh, to save these passwords in a text file uh, that you can then later store away. So I'm going to just go to the desktop here and call this, you know, Event Century DB Credentials. And that's all you need to do. And now you have that available. Obviously, don't share this with anyone uh, who shouldn't have access to Event Century. Uh, then we have the database purge. So by default, uh, data that is older than 30 days is removed from the database. You can change this to a number uh, that works for you. Um, let's change this here to 90 days. And here's a warning threshold for the maximum database size. This, is, this field is uh, a little misleading. It doesn't actually limit the size of your database, but it will uh, issue an alert if the database size exceeds this limit of 10 gigabytes. The first component now that we'll have to decide whether we want to install it or not is the heartbeat monitor. The heartbeat monitor uh, is in most cases a no-brainer that will ping your all of your monitor devices and let you know if any one of them becomes offline. It will also ping TCP ports and it's also responsible for issuing SMP queries uh, towards your devices. So if you have network devices, routers, switches, non-Windows devices, uh, that you want to retrieve uh, SNMP information from, like CPU usage, network bandwidth, and so forth. That's all done by the Heartbeat Monitor. You can leave this as a local system account in most cases. There are some scenarios where you can't do that, especially if you're not using the collector. But for the sake of simplicity, we'll leave this as is. Uh, the next component here is the network services. So the network services is a component that's responsible for receiving syslog data from remote machines. Again, network devices, Linux machines can send syslog data to Event Sentry and can also send SMP traps. Another responsibility of the network services is NetFlow. So if you have NetFlow enabled devices, again, mostly, usually this will be a firewall router, then you can, uh, then the network services is responsible for parsing and 
collecting that flow data. And network services also includes the ARP daemon to detect and keep track of uh, new devices that are being detected or found on the network. Then we have the collector component. Generally recommended the collector sits between the database and the agents. So if you don't want your agents that are you know, running on all your monitored servers and workstations to talk directly to your database, which in most cases you don't, then you'll want to enable the collector. Another advantage of the collector is that it encrypts all communication between the agents and the collector. And it also helps with distributing configuration updates. So whenever you make a change, you don't have to manually push it to your agents anymore. And it also manages patches uh, for you. So anytime you install a new version of Event Century, the collector will or can automatically deploy those, uh, those new binaries to the remote machines. And last but not least, we have the AD monitor component, which tells us here uh, that the service account was already found on the domain. And this is in fact accurate. Uh, so this is a test machine that's on a domain where a D monitor is already running on a different test machine. Um, so I'm going to paste the password here for the user account. We can hit the test button to make sure uh, the password is correct, and, and it is. So that's great. Uh, a D monitor essentially uh, monitors your Active Directory directly and provides you with uh, reports on any attribute change that's made to an object. It gives you before and after values. It monitors group policy changes, again, with before and after values. It also provides you with a user inventory, so you can see exactly which users are in your Active Directory. Uh, when were they created? When was the last password change? Are they administrators? When was the last time they logged on? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a great feature for identifying potentially problematic accounts that should maybe be disabled or removed, for example, contractors uh, or users that have left the organization and so forth. But in addition to that, of course, it gives you granular information on all changes that happen in the Active Directory, whether it's a user being created, a uh, user being moved into different OUs and so forth. All right, so here we have a summary. And we'll just click Next to finalize this. Again, I will speed this video up here. And that's it. Installation is complete. I'll click Finish here. I'll hit Yes for the maintenance check here. And voila, Event Century is installed. If you want to deploy an agent to a remote machine, it's very easy. You simply either create a new group here where you select the group here and add a computer. You can also import computers here uh, from Active Directory or from a text file, for example, or from the network neighborhood. Uh, so, so simply uh, click Add here, add the host name, server1234. And all you need to do is click the Deploy Agent button. It will change the view here and then just hit go and that will deploy the agents. And that's how easy it is. Of course, you can also select the entire group and hit deploy agent to deploy the agent to all the computers. And that's really how easy it is to set up Event Century. Uh, check out some of our other screencasts uh, to help you get started with Event Century. And thank you for watching.